right, here's another one. It's about kind of like the Bible version type of deal. This is, um, I got this from Isaiah 66, verse 3. If you look at the um, third verse in the NLT, when it says, when such people offer, when such people sacrifice an ox, it is no more acceptable than a human sacrifice. Meaning like, um, as if God really wants a human sacrifice. That's not the way it's written out. It's written out a lot better in uh, the King James Version. He that killeth an ox as if he slew a man. He that sacrificed a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an ob oblation as he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense and as if he blesses an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways and their soul delighteth in their abominations. Anyways, and then if you read this other one, if you continue in the same verse in the NLT version, it starts to sound a little bit more comfortable, but my, my message is like, when the Lord is speaking to you, it should <coughs> it should just ring true throughout the whole thing. It shouldn't be like, uh, that's kind of weird, and then, okay, I guess I'll accept it because that part right there was fine. No, I think that we need to be careful about everything that comes through us and what we bank on as doctrine and what we bank on as um, right theology and what we bank on as right scripture for our own protection. We don't want to listen to weird stuff like that. We do need to be comparing the scriptures compared to each other. If something doesn't look right or doesn't sound right, it's important to check around. God has me uh, unlocking deception, uh, opening up the devil's plans for us to easily see so we can clearly understand how to counteract those very things. And one of these things is something I haven't laid down yet, but I finally have enough. Uh, actually, I think I have enough stuff to lay down right now. I'm actually going to go ahead and lay it out. It's a really, really important message. I thought at one point it was one of the most important messages that I've ever had. So here it is. It's about... The devil's plan, devil's best plan, as far as destroying <clears throat> people in relationships and messing up the whole nation. Because I, I said it before that you mess up the family, you've messed up the nation. That's why you got, like, Satanists out there praying, praying and fasting against the families of America. Because you mess up the family, you've destroyed the nation. You destroy the nation, they're, they're more likely to be more susceptible to lies. So then you can punch them in with all your stupid lies, Sex in the City, and all the other stupid shows that are out there destroying our nation completely just changing the way we see our nation. Anyways, back to the parent. Devil's best plan. Sex too early in relationships. We already know how the Bible says it. Don't have don't have sex outside of one woman marriage. You're married to one woman for the rest of your life. That's who you are allowed to have sex with. Sex too early in relationships is this. It's relationships that are built on sand relationships that are built on sand so it makes eventually for a broken heart because the sand is there it's underneath the relationship and things go wrong and it will always fall it makes for a broken heart and if it's not properly treated you are a wide open target to the enemy of to the enemy's lies the lies of the devil constantly pounding you in so all these stupid shows that you used to think were completely weird start to make a lot more sense to you now because you're starting to identify with people who've gone through trash and made bad decisions and instead of just saying I gotta get out of this thing we just start to identify with it and start calling that our medication and our our entertainment and what happens to the man? He becomes a player and starts looking at every girl like a sex object and battling lustful spirits and open to gay spirits and open all that weird, weird stuff. It gets weirder and weirder from there on out, I promise you that. And what happens to the woman? The woman, she becomes tougher and more self-sufficient. A woman's lib comes to mind. Broken heart from a woman. Now she's not home with the kids. She's out there being more tough and more independent and less of a woman, more of a man. It's an abomination in God's eyes and more apt to be a lesbian wallowing in unforgiveness. It's a hurt thing. It's a messed up thing. It all starts from the devil's plan seeking people to get into sex too early in relationships. And also not even just sex before. It's, it's also just being in the wrong relationship and getting in relationships with people you don't have any business being in relationships with. But I have a word 
that God gave me a long time ago that I've, I'm finally laying down, and it's one of the most important things I've ever told you. So I want you to listen to this. It's godly relationships, because I was just sitting there driving around thinking, I know I'm a Christian. I really am serious about the Lord. And I'm looking, I'm driving around, and there's women everywhere. I'm like, so I'm like, one day I'm asking God, why is it so hard to just think of one woman? Why is that such a difficult thing? I mean, didn't you make it so this would be, like, you know, perfect and all that stuff? And I'm, like, out there, look, seeing beautiful women all the time. And, I, I mean, I could see myself in a relationship with all of them. <laughs> so I'm like, this is ridiculous. I know this is not you, God. So then I, so I had a recommendation for the Lord. I had, I had some advice for God. I say, so I recommended to God. It's like, God, why don't you do it like this? Why don't you make it like this? Do something like this. Like, say, make it so when... You find your woman that she is all you ever want. When I find my woman, that's all I'll ever want, Lord. Make it like that. Instantly, the Holy Spirit says, I did do that. I did do that. Remember? When you thought fairly and innocent? <laughs> Remember when you used to be innocent in the way you looked at people and thought and how you pursued your relationship? You, do, you didn't see the same. And he showed me how honest I once was before my broken heart. I was never interested in any woman fully till I met my girlfriend and was fully devoted to her, romantic to the T. And the problem was it was the wrong relationship. It was a the relationship was a bad tree and it produced bad fruit and it took me down. And that gift that I recommended to God, that one time thing I was recommending to him, he says, Yeah, it was true, but it was broken now. So now I'm suffering. So for all this time after that, it's been it's been downhill from that. I've, I've suffered that, and I would say for the rest of your life, like a broken bone that can heal, but never really be as strong. And I am that way, and most of the nation is that way. We've all had a broken heart. It's not God's plan for us to have a broken heart. It's a horrible feeling, terrible thing. It's a fallen nation. That's the way it is. So I, 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 here, here, here's something. Here's the good news after that, and I'm not even perfectly clear. I've got the, the full package of how to fix that, but I do know that walking in godliness after that and doing His way is definitely the best plan part of it, but there's something else besides fixing that thing, too. We want to heal the bone as best as we can, and almost as if we can put that whole thing behind us. Like Job had a really tough time, but it got better later on. Praise the Lord. I was reading about Adam and Eve and how their hearts were completely innocent before they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then came the trouble. And now an open door to deceit with her rejection, loneliness. <laughs> and I've developed a new strength of not attaching to women in that kind of way that can hurt me as much, but way more so because I can see a part of this very serious relationship in many, many different women now. And I'm nearsighted and blind and to the way God has originally designed. But let's get into the book of Joel real quick. Joel 2. Everybody knows about this one. This is one of the most important things. It's talking about the sevenfold return. What the locust has stolen, I'm going to give back sevenfold. And that's the, that's the good news. It's like, you know, when, when Job lost everything, he got back double what he had. But that's, that's good because the guy was already ridiculously rich. Totally amazing, godly man. Just a just something for him to learn it had nothing to do with his righteousness so all of those guys were rebuking him about that anyways that's completely off subject godly relationships another thing that I thought was really really cool um, to back up what I'm talking about right now in relationships something Dr. Laura said she says that all of the women who call her are not proud of their sexual past great regrets and I do believe wishing they had done it differently. When you have regret, you wish you had done it differently like God originally had planned. Safe and in order. <laughs> and in that, you're probably losing all the anger and the paranoia, which is all, just never a good thing. That's no way to live. We should be free and happy living in the thinking about the good things, you know. Those other things are good, lovely, pure. And you can think like that and you can live like that and be on the upside of things. But now because of the God, devil's plan to destroy us, that we have fallen into, even the church. It makes us wide open to all these problems. So the, the, the point now is to at least understand what he has done is a very, very big deal. And the next thing after that is to figure out how to heal. First step is obviously just 
getting back to the going back to the old godly way like Jeremiah says go back to the old godly way and walk in it that's the best way to do it but um, for anybody out there who has a broken heart I want you to know that there is an answer on the other side of that anybody who has a broken heart I'm just gonna say Lord bless that heart and save it and protect it Lord God and help this person to walk in the way that you would have them walk Lord and protect them from here on out, Lord God, to walk in the right way that would keep them safe and from this danger again. And, to, and all the things that have attached itself that don't match you, Lord God, that are against you. And all the lies that have attached during this traumatic ter time, terrible, horrible, painful time. All the things that have, all the lies that have attached, Lord God, loose them all off in Jesus' name. Set them free, Lord God, from all the unforgiveness and all the all the hard things that have connected to them. Back to the original plan, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <clears throat> yes, God says that uh, the churches are filled with people who are trying to hear these messages that are going to comfort them and give them good news and all that stuff. But the truth is, is that they're not getting the they're not getting the good news. They're getting they're getting like a bunch of hot air. It's qu quite frankly, they're getting a, a lot of comforting words that are are not true. The com the, the comfort is in the truth. The truth is, is that we're off pa we're off page, and we need to get back on page so we don't have to have problems and all these things that couldn't go wrong. We need, I mean, uh, we're going to have problems, yes, but we, we do want to have that blessed assurance. We want to have the peace. We want to have rest for our souls. And the, the prophets, or the, the phony prophets of old, there's like a real prophet, Jeremiah, and he says that God, God's, God's speaking through him saying, yes, even my prophets and priests are like that. They offer superficial treatments for my people's mortal wound. They give assurance of peace when all is war. And they are ashamed when they do these disgusting things. No, are they ashamed when they do these disgusting things? No, not at all. They don't even blush. They're just making it up over and over. These wrong prophets talking. We don't have to have wrong prophets talking. We have people who are just afraid of people, and they 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 don't they aren't seeing things clearly. The truth is, is that the sin's got to be gone just to even begin the show. We don't have a real show going on. We have a show that just it, that's that's all it is is a show. But we want the we want his show to be shown. We we want his truth to be known. We want to be in his glory and in his transformation power that we can actually know what we're holding on to. Paul said we have to. Walk walk in the spirit. We need to walk in it. We need to go back to the old church and walk in it. Jeremiah says, look for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. There are some things that will never change with somebody praying over you. You can have the best of the best of the best pray over you and nothing will happen. Why? Even Jesus prays over people and says, one time he says, according to your faith and praise. So if you have a faith issue and you have a belief issue and you have a theology issue, you have a unbelief issue and doubt and all that nonsense, I mean, you might as well not even get prayed for by anybody. Smith Wigglesworth said, don't come up here twice and I'm, that, that means you got too much unbelief and you're not going to get healed anyway so don't even bother coming up here and he just he tells it like it is it's like you got to have faith and that that has a lot to do with whether you're going to get healed or not say so jesus christ the one that you say you're serving but uh i really do believe that i i, I just heard it said like that well i've been prayed i've been prayed for by the best it's like um, doesn't matter who you get prayed for by you need to um get your own self in line here it has a lot to do with whether you're going to be healed or you're going to be cursed and it has it's it's god's politics and he's not the one who's going to change it's either your hand or your heart's going to have to change or you can just uh be stay afflicted but uh truth is is that uh it's not according to who's praying for you it's according to you willing to deal with the real issues smith wigglesworth said it best he said that uh if you go to pray the heavens should open up over you right away and if they don't open up right away, there is something wrong. Something is the matter, and the matter is never with heaven. Heaven is perfect and unchanging and unshifting. The problem is always with us. It's always somewhere we stepped off because of, my goodness, so many different things. you got to figure out, man, where did you lose your momentum at? Where did you, where did you go from 
60 to 0? Where did you go from life to wilderness? Why, why are you stagnant in your walk with the Lord? And, and if you could be dead honest, just between you and the Lord, just go back to where it was and figure it out. Where did he do that? And just keep asking, Lord, where is it? Where was it? And until he tells you. But you got to find those places because there's a place that stopped the blessing. And you got to go over there and reverse that problem. And you got to find all those problems that go back and back and back. Sometimes you got to keep going back. But to get back to that sweet communion of the sweet smelling Savior is worth it. If everyone, if every person was just led by the Spirit, you wouldn't need a lot of the things you read about in there for correction because you'd already be walking in his best plan for your life. And I believe that the words in the Bible have so many different things, especially like in the Proverbs, but it's all over the place. It lays out God's theology for different situations and all the, all those different like scenarios. You, you, can, you can just see how God's like, in this situation, this is the best way to think. And this is in it, over and over for all those different situations. But, so we, we've got a lot of disobedience to the Spirit nowadays, and it's totally obvious. So my thought is that I think the, the church is really going to need a book called Unlocking Deception to, just to help people get into the Spirit. And when someone is not in the Spirit, it's very easy to tell who's not, or someone who is in the Spirit, it's very easy to tell who's not in the Spirit just by looking. And so my book, Unlocking Deception, is going to help clear up a lot of the little tricks the devil will use to get you out of the Spirit. Everybody wants everybody to follow them. Everybody wants to be the one who's showing everybody. The, everybody wants them to agree with them. But my, my, my thoughts are this. is like, don't follow anybody who's not following Jesus. Don't follow anybody who's blind in the, in the church. Don't follow anybody who's not hard for the Lord, who doesn't just preach the uncompromised word of God. We've heard all the other stuff long enough. The devil wants you to agree with him, and he wants you to follow him to hell. We are so far removed from the original plan. The biggest joke in the world right now is the American church. You're going to go to heaven first. You are going to heaven first because the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. God told me to tell you again about this is about the uh, the we're a temple, we're a tabernacle, we're, we're a city, we're, and we have gates to our city and all that stuff, and our gates represent what's going on in, this, in the inside of our city and all that. But um, the message that I, uh, I'm getting at right now is we are the governors of our own city. Like, we're, we are the governors of this temple. If we want to be leaders of something, we need to be leaders on our own. We need to be the one who takes charge of our life. We need to take authority over our own life. We can't just like be like even if you don't have someone to be accountable to right now you need to be accountable to God and you need to be accountable for yourself at the at, at least so you can be a leader of your own self so you can just like have something to offer as a covering you can make yourself a, 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 a an authentic Christian I mean a real authentic Christian it only takes one to rock this planet my goodness gracious all you got to get is one person who believes and to get into a right place with the Lord and to see his truth for what it really is and oh man and oh man and oh man but I'm just saying that as a whole we need to take charge of our own life. We need to take authority over our life. We're governors of our own city, and we need to rightly govern our own city. Don't know why God told me to tell you again, but we do need to be in charge of our own lives. We can't just wait and hear and this and that and all that. Every day we need to take authority over our own lives and make these things, you know, do whatever it takes to keep our head on the right track. Even for a brother who is ready to just stand up and start to tear up this nation for the Lord. He just really wants to rise up and come out of this curse that's on the nation from all the sin. It's uh, it's it, it's difficult. It's more difficult than difficult as far as I'm concerned because you've got such heavy opposition, not even from the world. I'd say even more so from the church of all places because a lot of the church doesn't like to see this kind of thing happen. They don't like to be put in their place, but the prophets of the old are 
like constantly judged of using their own power and not really leading people in the right way but constantly saying things that are all good and it's really not good because it's really what is is and it's a cursed thing and they just rather tell people nice things like it's not cursed everything's fine god's gonna protect us all the real prophets are saying uh we're in danger we're screwed if we don't fix this so i think that the I think the things that uh, can be against the leadership <clears throat> for people who are looking to be a leader and to lead the church into the direction that God really wants it to, this nation, I do think that uh, it's going to be quite a hard step for a while until the, the momentum starts to kick in. So one ingredient or one way you can tell if a prophet or a leader is a true leader of God is if they lead you away from sin. The false prophets lead people into sin. They actually congratulate them or something like that. <laughs> Let's see, what does it say? Yes. But now I see that the prophets of Jerusalem are even worse. They commit adultery and they love dishonesty. Hmm. Praise the Lord. God's people constantly lead people away from sin. That's the fruit of a good leader. I like people getting a lot of stuff out of their mind about God. And I want people to love God a lot. And not, lots of people want to be God a lot. And people like God make stuff go. And God makes stuff go a lot, and a lot of stuff makes stuff go, some stuff. Um, well, everybody likes to be God, and other people like to be God, so pray of the Lord, Lord, we go to heaven, we can go to heaven if we believe in God, and all the people can be God if they want to be God. Oh. Jesus, name we pray. Amen. <laughs> okay, what is your name? Say your name. I love you. Want to talk? Jordan? Um, my name is Jordan Santiago. And you're five now, huh? Mm-hmm. And, and what is this young, what is your name? Say hi. Hi. What is your name? Come on. Yeah. Are you three? I mean, are you only one, huh? One years old? Leilani, what's your name? Who came to visit you? <coughs> Uncle Rob? Other shoes? No. <laughs> Talk in it. Say hello. Yeah. She's just gonna eat it. Where's do you want shoes? do you want some candy? Dead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just Hi, my name is Jordan Santiago and I'm five and I want I want to be the Lord of God and everybody loves God a lot. Alright, good job. This is my, I am five year old and I'm Jordan Santiago and I like Batmans and Power Rangers and Supermans a lot and we went to a movie once last time and I lost my Superman. Hi, my name is Jordan and I am gonna play a 
every song at home for Robbie and Mom. And every time I go to church, I learn about Jesus and God. And God and Jesus is the coolest people ever. He, they made, they made the sky. They made us, and they made, and they made cars, and they made food, and they made, um, they made rocks. Hi, this is Cindy. Um, I just came back from church, and worship is really awesome. Yeah. Okay. What did you like about the service? Um, and did you say anything during the word that you liked a lot? Um. No, well, I already kind of knew most of it. Like get closer to God and just, yeah, I thought I could use that in my life. Yeah. Are you thinking about joining a small group? Um, yeah, I kind of already am with my friends, but yeah. Oh, cool. Well, praise the Lord and thank you for listening again. This is Robbie. <laughs> something, something I like about God is how he's so forgiving and willing to do anything for us he can just if we like if we pray for him for someone then he can usually answer our prayer when we most need it that's really what i like about god okay robbie what is your favorite thing about god my favorite thing about god is that he is a faithful god even when we are sometimes not faithful, or a lot of times we're not faithful, he is always faithful to what he promises. He promises never to leave us or forsake us, even though sometimes we try to leave him or forsake him. But he's always willing to take us back in his in his um, in his will and his in his promise for our life, and still tries to make something great out of uh, the things that we try to destroy. <laughs> so, Robbie, is that also why you love God? Because he's like faithful. Yeah. Because he's faithful. Okay. Because he he doesn't he doesn't change with like he always his politics are the same whether his politics don't change. He's a he's a solid rock that cannot be moved. He he doesn't change with uh, new ideas. He doesn't he doesn't <laughs> he he just is what he is and mm -hmm, she's just she's shouting praises right now. For the garment, she's garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Middle one. Okay. I something very happy. It got a gray. And I'm an old dear. How to you. And don't take my Happy birthday to you, Grandma. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Cindy. Happy birthday to you. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Yellow, red, and black, and white. They're precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Everybody. <laughs> Bad and it's good at the same time. Okay. Um, so it was Saturday night. Me and um, Dinah are staying up really late. It's like 1.30 in the morning, and my sister left for work because she's a CNA for OHSU, and she forgot her phone, which she never does. And so we're staying up late. I don't know why. So her phone's sitting there, and it starts, like, starts ringing, and I never answer anybody else's calls, but Dinah's like, well, who could be calling? 
Um, so I was like, answer it, answer it. And so she grabs it, and it's our brother-in-law. And um, he, the first thing he tells us is, um, I have an older sister, Susan, who's a pilot. And um, she lives in Michigan, but she was in Texas, and she'd been calling family all day because she's stuck at a hotel. And he goes, Susan just got in a hit-and-run accident. I don't know how bad it is, he's like, but I'm leaving to go to Texas right now. He's in Michigan. And he's like, I think it's really bad, though. So we're sitting there, and we're just like praying. We stayed up till like, 3 in the morning just praying and praying and praying because we want it. We don't know how bad it is. We, we literally don't know if she's going to die any minute. So we get... Um, the next morning he calls and he, I mean he just gives us his gruesome details about like we thought that she literally would have lost her arm and um, so we're sitting there we're praying and praying and I'm just, then we come to church and um, he later calls us and he tells us about this accident it's literally a miracle that she's alive um, she was crossing the street and a car zoomed in around a, le- a lane of like four cars and came into the turn lane and literally hit her going 40 or 50 miles an hour and by Sanders said her body went like 30 feet up in the air and she took like across 200 feet of asphalt. And there was a paramedic and his wife standing there on the corner and they said she's dead. Like literally that nobody survives that kind of an accident. Mm-hmm. Um, so they walk over there and they're just staring. Like I heard this from Susan later. She, she says they're just looking at my body with this weird expression on their face and she's like, I can tell they think I'm dead. So she's like, starts talking and they're like, this girl's alive. Like she's actually alive. And she tries to stand up, and they're like, no, no, your bones are probably all broken, you know. <laughs> and she goes, and um, so they, they get a stretcher over there, and the guy's like, limber life, limber life, because he's not worried about her legs or anything. She's like, you're not taking my leg off. He goes, oh, no, we're not going to, we're going to try to save you. And she goes, I'm not losing a leg, I'm not losing a leg. <laughs> so they put her on the stretcher, and they take her to the hospital, and she's like, call my boss and tell him what happened, you know, and it's in the middle of the night. And he, she yells at the doctor, "You're not. I'm not losing my arm, and I'm not losing my leg." And he goes, "No, we're going to save your arm and your leg, but we're going to need to give you blood." She says, "I'm not taking blood either." She's like, "If you can help it, don't give me any blood." So um, she had, she lost a lot of flesh on her on her left shoulder, but her arm was broken in multiple places. Her leg was broken beneath the, her knee, but they haven't. Her head never hit. And she doesn't have any internal injuries. It's literally a miracle that she's alive. So Dinah and Sue, we've been praying for her for a long time. Like just praying for, you know, just just for her to come closer to Christ because she doesn't have a place of fellowship. And, and I don't think her husband's a believer. Like he's been raised in the church, like Catholicism and stuff, but I don't think he's taken that step where he trusts Christ for his, for his salvation. So we've just been praying and praying and praying, and it's like... Um, Dinah and Helen, say, like, next day, jump on a plane, fly back there. Helen gets the time off of work, and Dinah's sort of in between jobs, waiting for a job. And um, so they get back there, and they, they're both CNAs, so they literally just took over, because I guess the hospital wasn't that great. And so they're, like, looking at her going, we can see people's prayers, you know. We can actually see this happening, you know. And she's, like, going, I can feel the prayers, you know. <laughs> so it's an incredible work of God. And it's, like, it started out as something that was, you know, just really a tragedy, really terrible, because it's, like, she's going to go through a lot of recuperation and stuff. But we were praying so hard that she could come out here. So tomorrow they're going to release her from the hospital. She's still in bad shape, but she's going to come out here and she's going to stay with me and Dine and Helen. And we're gonna we're gonna help her through it, and hopefully she's okay. gonna be what, able what's to. What's her name? Susan. Susan. Okay, so I have never met her. Nope, you've okay. never met her. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, she's a little miss independent. She's never been in a situation like this in her life, so. So we just. It sounds pretty. She's not open to, to. She's not. She she's open to, um, it's like speaking in tongues and people praying for her and healing. She's open to it, but not something that she's like personally involved in or anything. Mm-hmm. So we're just. We're just praying for her, and it's like that night, our family was totally, like, just laid out. I mean, we never had anything like this happen, and, you know, have Susan, like, in that kind of a situation, it was just terrible. So it's like, you know, you're struggling just to pray and pray and pray and pray, and, you know, um, it was Sunday night, we all get together, and my sister Hannah, you know Hannah, you've had her pray for a friend of yours, she's like, guys, let's get together, and we're, my little brother John's over there, Ethan, Dinah, Helen, and... 
I'm over there, but Richard wasn't there. Now, John is sort of like on the fence a little bit. He's been here, he doesn't speak in tongues, and never really, not really open about his faith. So we're sitting there praying, and we start getting really loud. We're praying, we're praying. I like got this awesome word about Susan, and we start getting these amazing words, you know, and it's like, God's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, love her, and he's going to restore her, and he's going to do all of these things, you know, he's going to bring her to himself. And, and it's just like we were just having all these amazing words, and then, I started just to move in prophecy, you know, and like I've never moved him before, and I just started like, I just felt the power of God, it was so strong, and, and so I started praying, I just saw my little brother John, and I was just like, I just knew, like, all the stuff about him, it was incredible, so, I, and he just starts crying, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, hearing the word of God about him, like hearing that, you know, that he's like one of those old time preachers from the 1800s, like the John Wesley kind of people, you know, I'll just start praying for him and praying for him. And he just starts to weep and he's just so broken. And then it's like, he's there for a little bit and we're still praying. And all of a sudden he just lets loose. And that boy just starts, I mean, speaking the word of God. He's like laying hands on people. He's praying at the top of his lungs. He's like thanking God. He's like, God, thank you for releasing his presence. And I was like, this is John. We're all looking at each other. He's like, Jesus, you're the man. We're like looking at each other. We're like, that's John. That's John. So God's doing an incredible work. So Man. I'm just waiting to so see wait, the who's, end of who's it. Who is John again? No, my little brother. Your little brother? Yeah, he's younger than I am. You guys have a big family. I have a huge family. So how many siblings? I have. Um, there's 12 kids in my family. Jeez. So. So I know. Four. I know your brother Richard. That's Richard. Two that are, are not here right mm -hmm. now that I have met. Mm -hmm. And then Susan, and then little John, and then a whole bunch more. I'm not very little. Well, he's pretty younger tall, John. but he's younger. Younger John. Yeah, so I was just like, thank you, Lord, just to see that happen. You know, <laughs> to see that. messages about formulas, formulas for life, patterns of life, such things like this. Uh, I think that I was, you, you get, you become exposed to something that is of a, another formula. You can identify with that and actually often subconsciously even or consciously adapt your own life to those formulas. So the most important thing, I mean, to make sure that you're adapting your life to the Word of God, of course, but uh, even more so than that, to, like, adapt it to Jesus Himself. It, it, the relationship is always superior to everything. The Word of God supports the relationship. The Spirit supports the relationship, and brothers in the Lord should support the relationship. And to be careful of the formulas. That's why I'm just more, more than often realizing that I mean, I already know the TV shows are just from the pit of hell. They're just horrifying. But one of the things about them, even if they're not, like, point blank, like, saying something against God or anything, like, so obvious like that, or just, uh, there's so much perversion and all that, all these, all these things that are very obvious, but also just the formulas of the way that they think and stuff like that can easily uh, infect and uh, afflict the way we think. And... I just think it's a very, very obvious thing that we should be looking out, watch out for other formulas. And ask yourself this, what what different thing are you doing in your life? How are you adjusting your life? How are you realigning your life from just even a week ago or a day ago to make you get closer to God? What what are you doing to go stepping closer to God? The Bible says draw near to Him and He'll draw near to you. But what are we doing to draw He's not going to draw near to you first. We're all waiting for like some type of personal revival that doesn't happen like that. God says, come to me first. What in the world are we doing different that we could actually be stepping closer to him? We can't just keep doing the same thing and act like this is it. We're just going to keep doing the same thing until we get... No, we have to do something different to make it happen. It happens like the dawn. The, the salvation comes like the dawn. The miracles come like the dawn. It comes instantly. It comes naturally. It comes just the way it's supposed to do. It comes. It will come. God comes when we put ourselves in a place that says we're ready for you to come. But God is holy and he has requirements for doing great things in our lives. There's a normal lamp, land of Christianity that is so own strength. It's so us. It's so us and we don't need God with that. But when you actually, some people get desperate enough where they actually do need God and they are 
forced to put themselves in a position that the Bible has always said. We, all, we get so desperate that we actually start to believe the things that the Bible actually says, and we go there, and we actually see a glimpse of it or catch some serious stuff or start a severe relationship. But I do say that we need to do something different than we did before to make something greater happen. Promises of the Lord are a reality in the people's lives if they do these things. God always has all these big promises and we claim them just to get a, just to a, just a, almost kind of smell these things as if they're a reality. But we've said them so many times we can barely even smell them anymore. <laughs> we can't even sense them anymore. But we have all these promises that we love to claim. Oh, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. It's like, dude, be careful. Most Christians, the weapons will prosper over you because the glory is not even there. The glory is, is, is the thing that protects you from these things. But it's not going to just happen when you just decide that you all of a sudden need God in a desperate situation. God's going to be like, well, you can go bow down to your stupid idols that you've been bowing down before. You don't lay before me. You lay on your couch and bow before your big screen TV. You have uh, found your idols, and I don't think that those guys are going to save you. They're just as dead as the stupid carved images that you've seen 4,000 years ago. They're just as stupid as bowing down before Baal and Asherah. doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. They're just as dead and useless as you know they actually are. We need to step in another place to make God attracted to where we are at. We can't just say, Lord, I'm going to do whatever I want to do and expect that you're just going to keep on doing something. No, God wants us to move to a place that's exactly what he wants in our life. It does have to match with the Word of God. Word of God has his politics and it has to be his politics even now. It does. So, But we're not always doing the exact same stupid things as the other people do. It, it, it looks different, so we have to ask God, what is it that you want? And that's what I'll do. And not to lie and backtrack like the dumb Judah people who got jacked in Egypt. Ezekiel 16 talks about God's people being whores. Different than most whores, because this is a whore, whore that actually paid other people to be a whore instead of just being paid and asked to be a whore with payment become a whore Israel became a whore by f looking for people to be a whore to and paying them to be their whore and this is exactly why you see Egypt take over them is because they were worshipping Egyptian gods they got nailed by Assyria because they were worshipping Assyrian gods. In this rock. <laughs> they did the same thing to everybody. God always gives them to the people that they want to be whores to. He's like, there you go. You can be now I'm gonna turn these people against you. They're gonna slaughter you. Over and over that happened. So the Holocaust. Probably they were worshipping German gods somehow. I don't know. That's that's not something I've seen in the Bible or in history, but it just it makes sense as the pattern that we've seen go on and on and on and on. God gets so angry. He finds he finds this father of an Am you know, the father was an Amorite, the mother was a Hittite, and you were just uh, a young woman not even ready to be alive yet. You were you know, basically fresh out. Following in your own blood, and God found him and found her and washed her off and waited for her to grow and develop. And then he married her, gave her the rings, the jewelry, made her name great. And in her greatness, she became proud and started offering herself out as a whore. God, and, they, and, they, and God's wife used all their jewelry and things to make other gods and commit whoredom with the gifts that God has given. Which is about uh, nutritional dog food. Kind of weird, huh? But uh, this is about um, God was teaching us about how nutritional dog food is like the, the, the scientific like kind, scientific engineer whatever. A lot of a lot of uh, preparation went into this stuff. It's like very, very healthy. They said like dogs will actually eat a lot less food when they have the right type of balanced nutrition in their diet. And so what they would do is they would, you know, if you have like a, a junky dog food, the dog would eat and eat and eat, trying to get the nutrients, not so much trying to fill his belly, but there's like a nutrient level that he's not getting, so he continues to eat and eat and eat and probably never really gets there with all that stuff and eventually gets full and never really gets exactly what he needs. But I, 
but if you give him the right balance of like the special stuff that's like actually designed for the animal to get what he actually needs, he will eat probably you know half or a little more than half of the actual food, but he'll be getting what he needs and he'll stop soon. He'll be satisfied at the right amounts. And I sense the same thing with um, Christians who aren't getting enough of the spiritual nutrients that they need for their, for their walk with the Lord. And what happens is they become very, they still become very needy. But when you got God and He is your shepherd, He's your real covering, you actually have all that you do need. And what, what's so beautiful about that is the Lord is our shepherd and you shall not want. Hallelujah. The Lord showed me something real cool today. I can preach this one. <laughs> I'll preach this one. I was at Safeway and looking around at all the different people. Not really, just looked at one person actually. This was the security guard walking around. He kind of looked like he was bored out of his mind, like he was trying to pretend like he was doing something for one thing, but he also didn't have much of a smile on his face. <laughs> There's like this uh, whole function going on at Safeway. You know, it's a grocery store, whatever store it is, whatever function you got going on. There's always the, the front people smiling. Hello, 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 how do you do? Uh, welcome, welcome. And everybody's, and it's the personality of the front side of the function. And then you've got the uh, people in the back, kind of like low profile, taking it low, joking around back there, having a good time doing their job back there, behind the scenes. Then you got somebody who's trying to watch out for the bad guys. He's got his eye out there. He's not smiling. He's got. He's not someone to be messed around with. He's taking it seriously, and he's not always smiling. He's a, he's a good guy. He gets off work and acts like a normal guy, but on the job, he's got his eye out looking for problems that are, can go wrong. Because there's, there's always an enemy of the function. So... I think it's really important to know that what the Lord does in you, if it, if it looks right to where it counts in your soul, then you should say yay and him, amen to that. And not worry about whether it looks like, oh, I'm not a minister of some sort. Brother, sister, you are. Yes, you are. And you are ministering to the Lord and to his body. And that's a yay and him, amen to that too. Praise the Lord. Yes, you are. Bless you and, and keep on doing what God tells you to do. Amen. Um, whether you have to have a job that's smiley and upfront, or you got a behind-the-scenes job, you're doing the work unto the Lord. It's the body that's doing the job for the head. He's the master, and we're the body doing His thing. And it's a it's a blessed and awesome thing. And uh, just for some perspective, on the body, many members, different parts. Amen. Sometimes when you. Uh see something in so much you, you just take it for granted like i i remember back when i used to collect lizards i i used to think it was so cool that i i could find this one kind of lizard and it was so I, it was so common that i didn't really care that much about it and then now like years later that one is actually like the really high commodity it's like very hard to find now so it, it raised up in prices and so it's more like exciting and now and all that stuff it's just the lord was really showing me something interesting about himself how he, he how he wants to like live amongst his people and he doesn't want them to take it for granted he, he wants to bless them and have like relation with them and just be like in love with them because he, he really really loves his people and over and over they just constantly were so blessed and it was so in abundance that they started to get proud and care less about where the blessings were coming from. They just cared about the blessings and they just started to get relaxed about everything and started copying all the other cultures around them and making God really angry. And so they always got punished and everything. But the, the message here was just like, don't take a good thing for granted. God did punish his people for their sins. They fell into deep sins as they worshipped other gods. They didn't help the poor. And they sacrificed their kids to the devil basically and so these were a lot of really the bad things that God hated what the Israelites were doing back then before he allowed Babylon to take over them the best of the best turned out to be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah it was a terrible thing basically my point here is God did punish them for their sins he says this is terrible I can't let it go unpunished but he does have another side to it the message here setting that up with that is this is like sometimes we wonder like what's going on in our lives like is it because all we got to do is just repent and instantly God's going to get us to that place or is it just the fact that we are inside of a punishment 
because of our sins in the past? Is it like that, or is it just like an instant link, or does God have different politics for each and every person, or each and every church, each and every family, each and every region, all those different things? I just think it's a two different things. We It could be um, some of the holdups as far as the, the real stuff comes. Um, I'm actually saying something that I think I've said before, but God is um, laying it on my heart, so it's coming out again. And it's about people seeking like special speakers and good messages and all these kind of things that help you get better and stuff like that. But I think that the Lord just wants us to... He wants us to die, really. I mean, when you come to the Lord, it's a it's a scary thing. It's a leap of faith because you have to lose all that you have, all that you are, all that you know, and, and it's a gigantic risk. And that's the only way you can ever really find the Lord is a gargantuan risk. It's a... Uh, it's a leap of faith and, that, and like how, how in the world is it a leap of faith if all you do is just say come into my heart I'll continue doing what I want to do and just add you to my collection I mean the light of Jesus is a real thing that most Christians I doubt even know what that is I think that they smelt it like they, they can actually sense it like they distinct I really believe it's there, and like just getting, just talking about it gets them excited. And we've mistaken that for the power, or we've mistaken that for Christianity. But Christianity is when you have given up your life, found His voice calling you to something, and followed that something, and walked into that thing. Then you are not only saved, but you are you're you're a Christian. You're saved, and everything on the other side of that is just I don't even I don't really know how, how else to describe it I mean the Bible says what it says and we have all these verses that we like to quote and stuff to make people feel good and like oh the Bible says that everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved but for every verse there's a verse that kind of counteracts that and it, it, like that one's that one's for instance, was taken out of context. It doesn't say that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says there will come a day when that when that is true. But when is that day? You know, we don't know what he meant by that, and we can easily just say all these verses that make things sound nice. But truth is, is that ultimately we've got to just have a repentant heart, and we need to for, forsake yesterday's life, especially the sin stuff. But besides that, be willing to give up your life, even if it's a nice, clean life, for the Lord, for that relationship with the Lord, so He can really be in you, and He can really be in you. I saw a picture of something, and it was describing the light of the light of Jesus coming into you, and it was making me just realize, I was like, man, I know what that feels like to have the light of the Lord in me. And I really wonder how many people actually know what that feels like to have the light of the Lord actually in them. And it, it terrifies me. I'm like, man, I really hope I'm wrong about this. Am I just like, is this just the way some believers are supposed to see it? Because, I, I mean, right now only some believers see it that way. A lot of believers don't see it that way. And it's it's not like it's hard to tell. It's like... That's how come there's so many different people, different denominations, and different ways of doing things, and different ways of angling things. And I'm like, I'm hoping that's just the way the Lord set it up. I'm really hoping that's the way it is. But, ah, uh, who? Scripture tends to lean with the people who are operating in the power. And oh, I don't know how to describe. I, I'm just, it's, it's such a toss up. Wondering, are we all right, and we're all doing what we're supposed to be doing, or are all, or are all or are some of the Christians right and some of them wrong? I just, it's just like, man, confusing kind of, but I guess we got to stick to what Jesus actually said. His words were so radical, and people are so worried about being nice and all that stuff, but Jesus' words are not exactly nice. I mean, they they are so strict and punch you in the nose, and it's, it's weird how, how we can quote those scriptures and take the punch away. It just weirds me out. Like I don't know how you can read those things, but some people manage to read these things and literally take the take the sting out of his words and leave us making things up <laughs> because we haven't really obeyed what he was saying. We've just changed the meaning to what we want it to mean. 
maybe because that's what we really want and we're too afraid to actually jump out in faith? Or are we just deceived and we actually think we're right about these things? Either way, God has his politics and they don't change with our deceit or our wishing that we could wish some of this stuff away. But the truth is, is sin keeps you from that powerful light of Christ inside of your life. Whether that means you're saved or not, I still don't know. I would just hope that everybody would find that super awesome lit place of the Lord in their life, truly. That would make me a lot happier. And I, I, I just hope to God that the church today is maybe, maybe just in Christ, but asleep. That would be fine, because at least they're going to heaven. But I still think it would be awesome for more people to understand what it feels like to have the light. Okay, I found something interesting. It's called the River of Healing. That's the title of it in the NLT translation. It's uh, Ezekiel chapter 47. And the man that's been showing uh, Ezekiel all the things about the new temple and all that stuff. And so he shows him this measuring rod. So Ezekiel gets to see how it's all going to be built. And it's kind of it's kind of like the old-fashioned writings in, in, in Exodus and Leviticus where it just takes you into great detail about sins and sacrifices and um, the building of the temple. It's showing that again for like the last six and whatever chapters. Well, after that it shows you from the temple um, there's some um, there's a stream flowing eastward from beneath the temple's threshold. The stream then passed right to the right of the altar and it's on, uh, on its south side. Then the man brought me outside of the wall, uh, outside of the north gate, and led me around the eastern entrance. There I could see the stream flowing out there, the south side of the east gateway. Measuring as he went, he led me on the stream 1,715 feet. And he told me to cross. At that point, I was up to my ankles. He went down another 1750. He was up to his knees. And on and on, he gets deeper and deeper till he starts swimming in there. And he finds out as he goes back, he realizes that there's life on both sides and all this stuff. Um, and there's trees growing and everything. There's like the water flows right into the Dead Sea, and fishes literally start living in the Dead Sea. And um, because it's so filled with life, and everything that touches this water is life, and all the fruit from the trees growing along the side will be from the trees. Yeah, the fruit is for food and the leaves are for healing. And it's starting to sound like I started getting, catching this. I'm starting to wonder since this is the new temple being built after it being destroyed, Solomon's big temple and I think it's going to be like rebuilt or whatever and this is like where it's talking about the rebuilding of it and a stream coming out of it. It's starting to sound like either the new Jerusalem or the new heaven or something like that because like in Leviticus there's a portrait of heaven with all the tabernacle being built and God's throne in the middle and all that stuff and this one's starting to sound kind of like that where there's like you know the Garden of Eden which is paradise and then you have this the the, the um, stream coming from the tree of life or something like that there's a stream going through there and then there's like the throne room um, in heaven where they described heaven where there's like um, the tree of life and then in, in there and there's like a river flowing through the through through heaven and this is kind of reminding me of that and it's just talking about all these different like really you know like this the stream going through here is really cool and it's totally for healing and giving life and all that stuff and what's really interesting about that also is that one of the prophets uh, modern day prophets they they had like some meetings that they were going to they're all really really tired they ask God for help and an angel of the Lord shows up and gives them some leaves and it gave them so much strength. So that's what this reminds me of. Leaves for healing. So very interesting. They're starting to tie something together. I could be completely wrong. It's just um, an idea. A woman who is walking in God's wholeness doesn't attract the flesh of men. It's like as beautiful as they can be it really, I really don't think of it as something that would attract the flesh of a man. It's like it's, it would more so attract a man to wanting to raise himself up to that level of, like, this is a woman who is obviously got her stuff together. She's serious about life, and she demands a just man. And that would attract the right side of a man. Because there's like the spiritual side of a man who says, I want to do it all right by the book. And there's a flesh side that says, I want to do everything by however I feel. 
And so, if you want to attract a man, and you want to um, dress inappropriately or whatever like that, and not walk in holiness of the Lord, and not walk justly, it's going to attract the man's flesh. If you want to attract the part that will actually treat you like a lady and, and respect you, you need to walk in God's wholeness like that. It matters how the it, it really depends upon the woman. But um, it doesn't matter who he was talking to. It doesn't matter who he was talking to, whether it was was it whether it was a message to Edom or it was a message to the Corinthians or a message to Judah or Israel or the Malachites, the Edomites, the Hudaites, the whateverites, it doesn't make any difference. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God helps you understand who God is and what he requires. People always talk about the blood of Jesus covers all sins. The blood of Jesus covers only the sins that have been repented of. Jesus does not forgive sins that you have not repented of. He says repent. That's the beginning of the whole thing. He always says repent. That's the biggest word in the Bible because we, Jesus even Jesus even says that you can operate in a level of faith, of miraculous, cast out devils and do many wonders and still not be saved. You don't know Jesus until you've repented from all your known sins. The word of God actually was this. The word that he was trying to tell me was that faith does not come from miracles. Miracles do not bring salvation. Miracles do not bring salvation. Miracles do not bring salvation. Watching someone raised from the dead doesn't bring salvation. Abraham says that someone being raised from the dead is not going to make him anybody believe. He says if you don't believe the holy prophets, nothing will convince you because faith comes from hearing the word of God. And we need to learn all of the words of God, old and new. Jesus quotes from Old Testament and New Testament. I mean, he is the New Testament. And he said the whole motion, and he quotes from the Torah, the latter prophets, everything. He quotes from the patriarchs. He quotes from everybody. He he knows that when God's talking, everything that he says is something to be banked on. It teaches you who, how you know. Like, if you listen to Judge Judy, for instance, you watch how she talks to people, and you know you get to know her, and you get to understand the way she operates in the law. And she just sits there and says, blah, blah, blah. You can almost just tell, like, if you say something to her, you can almost tell what she's going to say if you've watched that show a couple times. Or if you listen to Dr. Laura, you listen to her, and you don't even have to call her to get to know who she's, who she is or what she's about. You can listen to her tell somebody else something about their life, and you can get the answer to your question. So whether you're talking to her directly or not, you can still be submitted to the way she thinks. And quite frankly, I'm on her side. I, I believe what she says. I think she's very, I think she's a very godly Republican woman. I think she's awesome. So I say yes to her. But it, it, with any regards, the point is just words are very, very powerful. What do you believe? The words that come from God's mouth, every word that proceeds from his mouth is to be taken seriously. It helps you get to know him. And knowing him is it. Repenting from sin is how you know God. How do you repent from sin? You need to know what sin is. You need to know that you start by repenting from all the sins that you know. And you, and God will show you more and then he leads you to salvation. Zacchaeus talked to Jesus. And after he decided to repent, Jesus said salvation comes to your house then. Salvation comes after. The blood of Jesus does not cover sins until after we repent of them. God has a, a new heart. He constantly shows us what he really wants. And um, we, we've made a church where Christians aren't soul savers anymore. They're more like kingdom of, kingdom of this world builders. And it's kind of weird how that works. I mean, we do want to be soul savers, and we do want to have a nice thing to have here if that's what God brings us to. But it's really weird how the focus of a lot of the ministries I listen to are telling people what they want to hear and not telling them what the Bible says. And the world avoids the Bible, but then we have a church that says, I kind of want the Bible, but I kind of want to do it my own way. And that's the church that seems to be taking over the most. That seems to be the ones that people are comfortable at. And where people are comfortable, those are the kind of churches that grow like crazy. And it's like, I'm not quite sure that's really what God had intended, but I do kind of think it's at least good that people are, are in church and they're hearing the words of God as a, and as well as following in the world and all the plans and the, the politics of the world as well. I mean, I, I mean, I started going to church a few years ago. I was still 
completely in the world, but I started going to the church and listening to the truth. And so I had some truth to battle with all the lies I was taking, and, and that's better. So saying, I, I wish my son would go to church and all that stuff, that's actually a good thing, you know. Whether it's affecting him right now or not, at least he's having truth putting it into his life. And if he needs to be around someone who talks point blank, then buy him a Smith Wigglesworth book or something. Buy him a revivalist book or somebody who talks more direct and says exactly what they think and tells you specifics about your life. If you go dancing, clubbing, and you go to these kind of places and you do these other kind of things, these are the exact opposite of how Jesus would probably want you to live. If he delivers you from that and you know you're called to go back there and drag people out of there, that's great too because Jesus did that himself. Then he was a, an extremely anointed person. But then again, he wasn't riding right next side to these people saying, you know, he, did, he knew what he was doing. And for every situation, there's a, a best plan. And God's plan is always the best plan. And when you're in the Spirit, it's easy to see God's best plan for every situation. So you could be sitting next to a homosexual person or someone who's totally wrapped up in sin. And you know the heart cause of it because you're in the Spirit. And God would show it to you. And you, you, you it, there's, there's a right answer to everything. So even if something doesn't look right to the Christian church of today, or is that a righteous thing to do? I don't know. You know, God God does weird things all the time. His ways of doing things always require faith. And so whether something looks right or doesn't look right, that's, that's completely irrelevant. It, all that really matters is, are you walking with Jesus? Do you know him now? Is it the nowness of God? And is he leading you to these things? Or is he leading you to a place where you're just on a totally different path? You know, because the whole function is what we're looking at, too. Not everybody might be the ones down talking to the weird people downtown, or not everybody's going to be bringing people like that into the church, because there's people who, well, like from that culture, that'll never walk into a church. But there are people who can go out and bring them into a church. And there's just a whole bunch to it. And um, ultimately this message is every word that proceeds from the mouth of God and the words. Faith comes from hearing the word of God, and that's the, that's the main point of this message right here. Amen. One thing I wanted to add is it was in the Old Testament it talks a lot about uh, Judah being um, being off page and being punished from three and four times they've done different sins that were just terrible. You know, God's like his anger is bad when it's when you're doing one thing, living in one thing that's wrong and against the way he thinks and if it gets to be two and then three and it's like that's pretty much he's just ready to nail you and four he doesn't even apologize for nailing he just nails you that's what it says the minor prophet I can't remember which one it was three and for four transgressions I will not withhold my punishment on eight different nations Edom, Judah, Israel whatever anyways the things that he constantly says you guys are doing is like the poor aren't being taken care of they need to be taken care of that's what God's way is the next one is, your workers need to be par- paid fair wage. That's oppressing them if you don't. People who charge interest, God is against interest. It's not godly. It's oppressive, and it doesn't help anybody. And God is not for you to hold stuff over people's head. It's against God. Interest is wrong. That's why it feels wrong, because it is wrong. It doesn't help. It's terrible. Three things. That's the third one. The next one is people using, like, false ways of changing money. They'd have like fake weights and stuff like that and cheating people when they were doing their sales and their trades and stuff like that. And maybe um, selling bad grapes or something like that. Mixing the good with the bad and selling it all as if it was all good. And just just all kinds of different weird ways of cheating people. And these kind of things are not godly. But he just wants us to get back to the integrity. Back to the righteousness. Back to the very, this is right, this is wrong. This is considered stealing whether it was aimed at me or is it pro me or pro them, whatever. If it's stealing, it's stealing and that can, you can count me out of that. God wants us to be very, very fair with how we treat our workers. He wants us to pay them fair wages, help the poor, and not bow down to other idols. And that's a really fun one because my politics on that is that this world is filled with idols, the formulas of life, and all these different things are all idols and they're all, they really don't match up with the Word of God. And if you buy into these things, you're going to see how the, the fruit of buying into that stuff is your, your your taste for the Word of God goes away. You don't feel like going to church for the same reasons. You go to the church, and then you build the church around this half-church, half-world thing. Where 
where the real gospel isn't being preached. The real gospel is it's been altered, and it's almost been forgotten. And if you bring it up, it's like, oh yeah, that that is what the Bible says. Huh. And I, I really think people should just continue talking like that. So the Bible is getting preached. That original gospel is being preached, as well as all these other things about how to manage your money and how to help your, your marriage and how to do this and how to do this. And those are such nice, wonderful things too. Because, you know, you protect your marriage, you protect your family, you protect your family, you protect your nation. So that's a really big thing, too. They're all really nice things. You keep people out of the dumps with their finances, and you're, and you're going to help them be freed up to, to be more godly and be able to give more and to be able to free up the poor and to do all kinds of nice things and start making big plans and all this stuff. They, they are all good, but the, the root gospel needs to be um, in us, too. We always need to be thinking about soul saving, soul saving not just running down the street doing whatever, yelling down the streets and holding up big signs and all that kind of stuff. I don't really know how much fruit that bears unless God told you to do it, then I don't think we should be doing it. But, of course, you always obey God and do whatever he says, no matter what seems to be the outcome, because he knows what the outcome is. But uh, I do think that soul saving, just learning how to get our own life straight, befriend people who are around us in the workplace or wherever else that we know people and then just bring them side by side to us at church so they can hear the word of God and maybe all these words that are true are going to start impressing against all the lies that they've adopted and we change our way for his way and start to see stuff happen such an awesome thing man uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing the, the, the point of this little message here is just about God does constantly show what does make him mad. Like, you know, oppressing people in all those different ways. Yeah. And y'all know, yeah. I'm talking sun and moon and constellations. Get on out of my way. for your life. Plan on making money. Plan on having a healthy, good, godly family. Plan on having a, your own house. Plan on having your own future. Having your own thing going on. Just plan. Make big plans. Go for them. Shoot for the stars. But make sure all your plans are penciled in that God's rock can come and change it at any time, at any moment. And it wouldn't affect you at all. It wouldn't, it wouldn't shake your faith at all.